You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. My guest today on episode 51 is Dr. John Bose, superintendent for the Davis Joint Unified School District, and we'll get to that interview in just a few minutes. I do want to say I'm pre-recording this episode as I'm trying to take a few days off this week, and with the speed of developments in COVID, reporting just once a week is tricky, but I do my best. These reports are as of Friday, February 5th. Last Tuesday, Yolo County's public health officer, Dr. Amy Sisson, reported to the Davis City Council that Yolo County residents still face great risk, even as the number of cases of COVID-19 decrease and the number of vaccinations given increases. Sisson noted that while average new cases are decreasing and have been since mid-January, even at that, our numbers are still nearly double what the county was seeing during its summer surge. For example, 56 new cases were reported on February 4th alone. Sisson also said that the emergence of new variants of the coronavirus will require continued vigilance on the part of the public. The new variants are far more transmissible than the original, and cases are on the increase, especially in Southern California. She urged residents to continue doing everything we've been doing for the past year wearing masks, staying six feet apart from others, not gathering in groups, staying home as much as possible and washing hands regularly. Finally, Dr. Sisson said that until the vast majority of us are vaccinated and we reach herd immunity, it'll be necessary for people in public to continue with masking and distancing. As I say, most weeks we're in this for the long haul or we're in this until it's done. You know, most of my conversations of late have centered around two topics, testing and vaccination. As my interview last week with Mayor Gloria Partida in David, from, of Davis noted, the options for asymptomatic saliva-based testing have increased with the addition of a third site at the Veterans Memorial Theater. In a post-show discussion about the episode on my Facebook, one commenter noted it was a shame the Healthy Davis Together program could not be expanded to other parts of the county, where she said many essential workers and care facilities are actually located. Mayor Partita replied that Healthy Davis Together is working on increasing availability and noted that folks who don't live in Davis but work here are already eligible. The program has other aspects as well, such as help with quarantining when needed and incentives gifts and assistance for businesses and participants. Learn more at healthydavistogether.org. And Yolo County has begun an all out effort to educate and prepare its residents for vaccination. Even as questions abound about vaccine availability and current supplies here in Yolo have been exhausted, in a meeting with area nonprofits last week, the county's public information officer and COVID communications team lead, Jenny Tan, said they're planning for the moment the tiers open up to more people and more doses become available. To date, the county has administered approximately 7,000 first doses and 3,000 second doses to its residents. Something you can do right now is fill out the brief vaccine interest form and here's the link, https colon double slash bit.ly B-I-T dot L-Y slash vaccine availability. And that'll get you notified when it's time for your phase and tier. The form's available in English, Spanish, and Russian, and the county can provide assistance completing if necessary. I just did it today. It took me about two minutes to complete. And so I encourage everyone to do that as doing so will help the county organize and schedule future vaccine clinics. Let's take a moment for music and we'll be right back with our interview. My guest today is Dr. John Bose, who served as superintendent for the Davis Joint Unified School District since July 2016. For the past 30 years, he's led thousands of certificated classified staff and students throughout the state. 
He's led DJUSD's innovative work to promote 21st century teaching and learning to create safe and welcoming campuses that are responsive to student and staff social and emotional needs to close achievement and opportunity gaps and to further the work of diversity, equity and inclusion. I want to note we recorded this interview last week on the heels of a school board meeting that lasted until 1230 a.m. And that's just one of many long meetings in recent weeks and also in the midst of a several day website outage that's part of a widespread external platform problem. John, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to speak with me during the midst of all that. Thank you, Autumn. Great to be here again and appreciate the opportunity. Sure. So the last time I interviewed you was in March 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. And we spoke then about the rapidly evolving logistics of shifting to virtual instruction. I, I don't think any of us could have predicted then just how challenging this year would be or the kinds of stress it would place on the district and all its parts, admin, teachers, students, parents. And so now we're at a place where urgent calls to return to in-person instruction are butting up against public health orders that urge continued caution. And DJUSD is faced with decisions that bring challenges at every turn. Before we get on to how you're approaching that decision making, when we last spoke, you were really concerned about digital divide issues and the kinds of equipment uh, and connectivity blocks many families might face during the pandemic. How did the district resolve that? Well, we recognize that at times there is opportunity and crisis. Uh, achieving one-to-one -one, uh, hybrid program uh, has been a long-standing goal of our district, and it was an unrealized one. But we realized with an immediate need to create from scratch an initial distance learning program, it was critical that students had computers for home mm -hmm. and a way to access the internet. So we were able to uh, really focus our resources um, and utilize some funding that came to help districts for this effort. And we have fully achieved a hybrid one-to-one -one, uh, Chromebook program and hotspot program for students and families. If there is a family in DJUSD that needs a hotspot or a Chromebook to access distance learning uh, and they don't have one now, we wanna get one in your hands. Um, but that, uh, those early efforts have really paid off and we see a few people lined up every day at our tech office for some troubleshooting, you know, exchange of a, a computer or hotspot, mm -hmm. um, but that's uh, worked out great and uh, we plan on maintaining the one-to-one -one, uh, computer program into the future. Great, thank you for that. That was the easy question. <laughs> so next, um... I know the school board has outlined parameters for a phased return to schools. We'll talk about those in just a minute, but let's start with how you got to this point. Um, what has guided the discussion and what internal and external frameworks have been part of that process? Sure. When you're faced with uh, a complex and immediate crisis like the pandemic, it's important for decision-making that we're clear on the principles and the beliefs that our decision-making is anchored in. And we've used six guiding principles in DJUSD, uh, beginning with those of equity, access, and innovation. Mm -hmm. Those really help guide our initial work. And as we spoke of just a second ago, uh, that equity and access issue, you sure. know, making sure every student has a Chromebook and a hotspot. As we began to develop the distance learning program, our students and now, we realized that the principles of continuity, compatibility, and efficacy were key to make sure, making sure that we designed a distance learning program that would provide quality instruction and would be able to transition to um, the different phases we might find ourselves and as we've moved from uh, shelter in place orders of varying uh, degrees of restrictiveness and from the purple uh, to the red tier, back to the purple and then into deep, deep uh, purple. Right. 
Right. Uh, but these guiding principles have been a great anchor uh, to help guide our decision making. And then internally, there's been physical work on on school sites to to help ease or help guide guide you into that transition. Um, the last time we spoke, I, I I know you also mentioned things like uh, you know filters and having testing on site. Can you can you speak to some of that? Sure. And um, we formalize exactly what those conditions are at our board meeting on January nineteenth, okay. and it starts. Um, by letting the community know that we have outfitted every HVAC unit and every classroom with MERV 13 filters and with air purifiers. Those are in every classroom. Uh, we've ensured that safety protocols are in place um, in sync with the new Cal OSHA COVID-19 safety plan. Uh, we have a well-defined process for notifying families if there's a COVID exposure and quarantining and contact tracing. And real important is our relationship with Healthy Davis together and being able to establish asymptomatic COVID-19 saliva testing mm -hmm. for students and staff on or near every campus in our district. Wow, okay. Um, can you, I, I, I want to move on to, you know, the big topic of the day. You've been hearing an awful lot from, from parents who, some parents who are very eager that the schools reopen to in-person instruction. So I realize there are different plans in place for elementary versus second, secondary schools. There are hybrid approaches. I'd like to know more about that. And then I'd like to know what options families have in uh, choosing what works best for their families. So let's start with plans for elementary sites. Sure. And we just approved that plan last night for an elementary hybrid model and for a preschool uh, hybrid model as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guiding principles informing that plan were those of continuity, compatibility, and equity. We provided an initial hybrid elementary plan that would have resulted in a lot of shuffling of students and staff into new assignments. Mm -hmm. And we heard both from our educators and our families that um, that was very, it was very important to them because of the social emotional connections yeah. uh, that yeah. it developed uh, through distance learning with current teachers, that that was a priority. So uh, we went back to our uh, educator task force uh, revised the plan, had that vetted by uh, our superintendent's all advisory team, which includes parents, educators, uh, all sorts of folks from uh, across the community, and came back with an elementary hybrid model that allows um, for a choice. Uh, students can come back on campus, they can remain in distance learning, uh, but in either circumstance, they'll keep their same teacher. That was a key piece in the development uh, of that model. Mm -hmm. So, and then secondary schools, are there a, a different set of criteria or a different set of, of um, operating instructions, if you will, for secondary sites? Well, it's really interesting because the same principles inform the development of the secondary model, continuity, compatibility, and equity and this focus on making sure students and teachers were able to stay together. Uh, but with um, older students and secondary, uh, some more skills, some more independence, some more maturity, they're using a simulcast or a Zoom in the room model. So whether you are a student participating on campus or participating uh, from home, you'll essentially be in class together with the teacher you've already had for the course of the school year. Okay. I think the big question everyone's been asking is when? And we've already talked about some of the external factors that, that complicate that answer. You have to be responsive to changing public health orders. Um, you have to make sure that all the thing, all the factors uh, we, we talked about, testing sites available, um, contact tracing, all the 
you know, the physical requirements are, are in place. But what is the latest thinking? And again, uh, there was a school board meeting last night, February 4th, and I realize some of these decisions may have been made there. You bet. And some were also made on the 19th and the 21st of January. Yeah. And in those meetings, two important external conditions were established whereby we'll be able to return to a hybrid model of instruction. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to go on the internal variables we discussed earlier. Sure. So first, our county, Yolo County, will need to be in the red tier for two weeks. That's the first condition. The second is that uh, either the Pfizer, Moderna, or another emergency use authorized uh, vaccine that may become available has been uh, uh, av made available to our employees, mm -hmm. uh, both shots, or if it's one shot like the Johnson & Johnson, if, uh, it's approved and came our way, and that employees have time to uh, recover. So when vaccines are available and we've been in the red tier for two weeks, uh, we would be ready to come back in a hybrid model. Now there's also a date by which we would remain in distance learning for the rest of the year. And that was established last night. So during the week of May 3rd to 7th, because you need a little bit of flexibility, if those external conditions are not met, we would remain in distance learning for the rest of the year. The rest of the academic year, right? Which ends yep. June 10th, I believe this year. Correct. Yep. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, vaccine availability is one of those external factors that you, the district doesn't have control over, obviously. And I was on a call yesterday with uh, the county's COVID communications lead and she talked about the number of vaccines that have been given already and that the fact that um, our, our county is currently out of vaccine and you know everyone's waiting. And she also about, talked about the, the tiers under which people will receive vaccines. So I imagine that the ongoing development there is actually going to have quite a bit to do with when the schools can, can reasonably expect to reopen. And, and it's still a question mark, correct? Yeah, vaccine supply is critical factor. Yeah. All right. Um, we've I've, I've mentioned a couple times, I know you're hearing a lot from, from parents, you're hearing from the community. Tell us a little bit more about what you're hearing from teachers, what their concerns and their hopes have been during this process. And um, you mentioned one mechanism by which you're getting teacher input. And I'd, I'd like to hear more about what that process has been like, the your administration and the school board and their communication with teachers. Sure. Um, so I'm in touch with a lot of teachers and what um, I think they're primarily concerned about are making sure that our students are learning, that our students are safe and healthy, and that they're doing well, not just academically, but socially, emotionally. And just because we're in distance learning does not mean you need to be alone. And the social emotional component is a critical aspect of our work. Yeah. Um, you know, when people say, where's the answer? It's in the room. And who we've had in the room as teachers uh, and other educators and support staff in the development of both our distance learning program and our hybrid models. Our teachers are professionals and experts. They know what they're doing and they've helped to design distance learning and hybrid models uh, that are right uh, for Davis. And we're confident uh, uh, in their work and the models uh, that have been adopted. Yeah. Um, I think um, our board shares uh, the same concern that teachers and our support staff do, that our campuses are safe for students and for staff. Yeah. And that's why we place these internal and external variables in place, because we wanna do everything and our power to reduce community spread uh, of COVID in Yolo County and in Davis. Yeah, I've, uh, over the last uh, 11 months, I've interviewed several teachers and I'll be talking to them more in the coming weeks. And, you know, I, I, I share your, what you just said that they are most concerned about the students, but 
they're also concerned about their their own well-being and and the long anticipated rollout of again the vaccines and that's you know it's it's heavy on their minds too understand yeah, we've heard that we've heard that and i i think that's why the condition was set with regard to vaccine yeah. and the red fear for two weeks great um, John, I want to ask you about, I, I, I was on Twitter this morning and I saw a tweet you wrote about the Youth Truth Student Survey, and I hadn't heard of that, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So we have partnered with Youth Truth for uh, probably a decade now, and it is a survey that we've given to um, students. We've also started to uh, provide an option for parents. Uh, to take the survey, uh, but in addition to the California Healthy Kids Survey, the Youth Truth provides us a lot of climate data, and mm -hmm. we find out information that we can um, disaggregate in all kinds of ways. Um, how am I feeling um, about school? Are there important adults in my life at school? Um, uh, what kind of programs are youth involved in? Um, on our different campuses. And it's really helped to inform um, our programming, both in terms of um, social emotional development and our local control and accountability plan and how we can best use uh, those precious dollars to make sure uh, we provide a program with an equity stance to make sure that when there is a student need, uh, we are meeting that need. Mm. You touched on something there too, and that's uh, the whole topic of extracurriculars and and kind of what's happened to those during the pandemic. Um, what are the discussions like around around that? People are very eager for their kids to be able to return to things that you know feed their growth and and development. And the pandemic has complicated that. Um, what's been happening during the the pandemic? Are are uh, sports groups meeting in any way or extracurriculars meeting in any way? Um. Yeah, that was an important part of a recent meeting and uh, resulted in a board motion. So we have had athletic conditioning going on uh, since March. We've had to pause uh, once or twice, uh, but our athletic teams um, have been able to engage in conditioning uh, work. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, proceeding with uh, expanding on-campus engagement activities for extracurricular, co-curricular, uh, and curricular opportunities for our students. Uh, we sent out a parent survey. We had a great response, over 1,900 uh, respondents with all kinds of ideas about what those activities could look like. They need to be done well and safely in coordination with the school principal. Uh, and consistent with whatever the public health guidelines at the time are. Um, typical of Davis, because we have such great community support uh, for the district, mm -hmm. uh, 300 respondents said they'd be willing to help uh, volunteer uh, for our programs. So we were looking at things like um, gardening, uh, reading groups, movement, uh, all sorts of activities uh, that our students will be able to come to campus and um, engage in uh, safe activity. Uh, but that uh, peer engagement and opportunity to connect with friends you've only seen uh, through a screen for the year uh, is very important. Yeah, I think it's pretty priceless right now. And I'm not at all surprised you got 300 volunteers from, from putting out a query, this being Davis. So, all right, we're, we're down to our last couple of minutes, John. Thinking back over the last year, and all this work, all this decision making, what are you most proud of? Uh, well, an important one is our partnership with uh, Healthy Davis Together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a program sponsored by UC Davis and the city, and they have been fantastic partners uh, in setting up free saliva based testing. I would encourage everybody to do that. You can get free testing at uh, the senior center by the county offices at the Vet Center by Davis High School and at the Mandavi. Uh, Healthy Davis Together has helped fund the uh, air purifiers that we're placing in our classrooms. We have a filter testing research uh, program on with them. 
And I'm very proud of um, our staff for the way they stepped up and reimagined education, um, essentially in a couple of weeks and launched our initial Google Classroom and then our uh, current distance learning program. Real tremendous effort. All right, and finally, what are your hopes for the months ahead? Where would you like to see all of this by, let's say, the end of the academic school year? Sure. So our goal is to launch our hybrid model and offer the opportunity for students to be back on campus. At the same time, we're already planning for summer school and how that might look different and for more students uh, than the traditional summer school program. And we are planning for a full fall reopening. We don't have a crystal ball and can't say what late August, early September will look like. Sure. But we are currently planning for a full reopening. Uh, lastly, I want to you know thank our staff for everything they've done uh, for our students. And I want to thank our parents and everyone else, friends, relatives, neighbors who have put different parts of their life on hold to help students in uh, a very different uh, environment than anybody is used to being in. Great. Well, again, I wanna thank you for making time for this interview, um, for using the opportunity to, to talk to the community about all this important decision-making that's going on. Obviously our school district is uh, a central part of our Davis community. It's why many families chose to locate here in, in the first place. And we're all concerned about the health and well being of, of our kids as they navigate this really interesting time. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for what you're doing, Autumn, and the opportunity to be here again. Appreciate it. This has been the COVID-19 Community Report from KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labe-Renault. This is episode 51, and I'll be back next week. Thanks.